और आप जो है Who is that? I can't hear I can't hear a seeing one. It's Omar. Who? I can't see you, man. <laughs> I'm right here. I'm at the gym. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you get your camera on, man? Want to see them pearly whites? <laughs> Ah, uh, here we go. in chairs. What's good, Jay Brax? I don't, who, who's that? You know what it is, my guy. Oh man, I, I can't, I can't even hear you, bro. I can't see you. You know who it is. No one got bars like me in this conflict. <laughs> I'm, I'm Mason, you're funny. <laughs> Try to get you to turn your camera on, bro. My hair is looking a little. Uh, I'll show you a quick peek, but it ain't staying like this. Hair looking a little crazy. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I do to the clients. If they if they don't got your camera on, I'm like, I can't I can't hear you. You got your camera on? I make it like it's their, make it like it's their their uh. <laughs> camera that I can't hear or something. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Omar? What right. up, Mason? How you doing? We got, we got Omar here running the show. What's up, Big TV? Got Omar, Omar in the house. You, you in there, bro? Yeah, I'm, I'm right here, but I'm working out, so I don't think you guys want to see me working out. <laughs> All right, all right. Thank you, Edgar. <laughs> Edgar, you the man. Okay, looks like we're good. Can you hear us on this microphone here? Javon, yes, no? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Yes, no, maybe so, okay. Yes, sir. Come on, Matt. Matt Brown is... Still alive in. What do you guys think? He's the Cinderella kid right now. Huh? <laughs> the Cinderella kid is in the house. The connection is unstable. You want to use my last one? I got a. Switch to the hotspot. 
folks. They're freezing. Let's see what happens. Tommy, we can hear you, but it's really laggy. Okay. Keep me updated. I'm switching this to a hotspot and hoping that solves some of this. And then we could always just go straight to the cell phone like we did last time. All right. How are we doing on, on virtual now? Good? Pretty good. Pretty good. All right. Just keep me updated. And uh, as soon as you hear something get muffled or messed up or whatever, uh, just let me know and I'll switch right over to my cell phone and then we'll have no issues. You know, so that's always a, a, a possibility if you're doing a Zoom call with somebody or whatever, just switch over to your cell phone because you have, you know, uh, your, what do you call that, a network? You know, well, no, not even a hotspot. You got your, your, cellular. your cellular plan, you know? Like sometimes I'll be in a spot and I'll be on the Wi-Fi and I won't be able to connect to whatever I'm trying to connect to, you know, hold on my email or whatever it is. And I'll, I'll swipe down on my phone. You guys know, right? You swipe down. Hopefully you got iPhones. Uh, and then you got this little, you know, Wi-Fi button on it. And you just click the Wi-Fi button off and on, you know? So I turn the Wi-Fi off. And then it it's, can't use the Wi-Fi anymore, so it's forced to use the network, and usually you don't have any issues, you know. So if you're ever dropping calls with clients, use that as a backup. And uh, I think you can get a backup line for like ten dollars a month. Oh, on top of that, just as a side note, uh, speaking about cell phones, um, we are going to be getting our own personal. Um, let me fix this view here. What are you doing, Mason? You keep touching what? the screen. You keep touching the screen and it's like. Okay, it kept, gonna, it kept lagging. I was trying to refocus it. All right. Okay. So we're going to get our own, um, what do you call it? Uh, code for AT&T, they said, and we'll get 8% off. So I'll, I'll let you guys know and that'll be able to start in uh, April. So if anybody has AT&T, you just basically just show them that you work here with the agency. And because uh, through AIL, we got a 6% discount, but but it went away or something. So they're like, well, for your agency, we could get you 8%. So I'm like, all right, let's do it. So just a little cool little side note there, 8% off. Sound cool? All right, nice. All right, so today, um, numbers, numbers, what it's going to take, uh, how to, how to, you know, basically get your sit downs that you need to get on a weekly basis and, you know, where all that's going to come from. So, you know, if you need to get a certain amount of appointments set, you have to just understand what it's going to take and get ready and roll up your sleeves. I think a lot of reasons why people don't give a lot of presentations is because it takes a lot of work to give a lot of presentations. It really does. Think about how much work it would take. If you're given eight presentations a week, you know, and you feel like you're working hard or whatever, uh, think about giving 16 presentations in a week. That's literally going to be double what you, you normally are doing. So how can you double the rate of everything? Doubling the rate of activity, doubling your results, uh, doubling everything, you know, and, and knowing the numbers behind all that really just helps from the beginning understand what you're kind of getting yourself into and what to expect. And then from there, you're able to have something to go back to the drawing board and see what to compare it to. Other than that, we're just going up against feelings. You know, I don't know what kind of coach coaches a team or coaches themselves or what kind of Olympic athlete doesn't have any sort of statistics involved in the way that they, they, they coach, you know, they're even measuring like this year, the big talk about Ben Roethlisberger was what, what's his big statistic they measured this year on him. This year, he had the fastest release from, 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 from like as soon as he gets the ball to releasing it than any other quarterback in, in, in the league. When he started, he had the longest because he would 
hold it, pump fake, spin, run around, do this, do that. And he was Big Ben making it happen. Now that he's older, he couldn't be Big Ben and make it happen. He had to rely on his being smart and, and reading the defense. And before the ball was even hiked, he kind of knew where he was going. And it was like, psh, 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 before he could get hit because he didn't want to get hit anymore because he was older, you know? But anyways, statistics. There's all kind of different statistics and all kind of different sports. I mean, that, look how small of a statistic that is, you know, being a quarterback. That's definitely not one of the major statistics that's really that important, I, I wouldn't say. So anyways, um, for you as a, uh, as a, you know, as a player, you know, in the business, because we're business athletes, then you got to know your statistics and you got to know what, what it's going to take and how to improve on them and uh, improve on each ratio along the way. But if you don't know what your ratios are, it's going to be hard to improve on that. So, you know, what I was really thinking about is our dashboards. You know, I was really thinking about just how important those are. And um, I wish somebody had something like that for me when I started. <laughs> I mean, I literally was scrambling around on sheets of paper trying to keep track of my numbers because I mean I was me myself and I and I'm trying to coach myself and he know what my numbers were and stuff and you know my, my manager kind of had some reports here and there but uh, I needed to have my own accountability so at the end of the month I knew like how many appointments I booked this month you know I knew how many people I saw and I knew what that ratio was and if it was not a good ratio I would be knocking on my boss's door on my manager's door or on whoever the top person in the office was show ratio was, I'd be knocking on their door and asking them, Hey, bro, I got 120 appointments booked and I only gave 30 presentations. Like I'm at a 25% show ratio. Oh, I'm knocking over the uh, magic erasers over here. Um, and I would ask people and I'd get it fixed immediately, you know? So, and they would probably feel bad for you if you did that. You know, they, oh my God, dude, you got a 25% shirt here. Let me show you. Like, I can't imagine one person here, you know, say hey, closing the door in your face, right? They, they definitely would want to help you out because 25% obviously is not, not good. We want to be a 50% show ratio or above, you know? And then we have to be masters on top of that, just as a little side note, as a tangent, what do we do with the people that we're not seeing? We have to be masters of rolling them to the next day or to later that day or to later in the week, but we don't want to lose those appointments. Okay. So once you set an appointment, it's so much easier to just reschedule that appointment. You already set it once. So just move that time, you know, that's why time kills deals. And that's why, you know, um, scheduling tip number eight in your playbook would tell you that, uh, always book the appointment on the first phone call. Every time that you call somebody back, their interest declines in proportion to how many times you've contacted them. So if I catch you on the phone today, I have two options. I can set you or I can get off the phone and we could agree to what, what, do we, what happens? We usually say, oh, give me a call back. You ever hear them tell you, give me a call back? Did anybody ever tell you, just call me back? You ever get that? You get, I got you know how many times I got that? In fact, the master got that more times than the beginner, you know, ever even failed at it, you know? So think about how many times the top people in this company got the same stuff you're getting, same exact stuff you're getting, you know what I mean? So the, uh, when, w whenever they tell you the call me back, right? If you take that and you tell them you're gonna call them back, then the next time you talk to them, guess what you have to do? You have to start all the way from square one and you have to work to what? You have to really try and get them booked for an appointment because you never booked them for an appointment, right? So what I say is they call me, you know what I'll do? How about what, we, what we'll do is since my schedule is so booked up, you know, we're gonna be area just for the next few days, okay? I know that you're typically home during these times. What I can do is I, right now, I have next Friday available, okay? This Friday available between three and four, okay? And I'll be able to catch you guys before you guys go off to your bowling that night and we'll get you guys all squared away, okay? Now, um, uh, uh, what, I, what I'll say is if you want me to give you a phone call back, I could give you a call back on Thursday, okay? Just to remind you of that time. And in the meantime, just remind your wife as well that I'll catch up with you guys 
on Friday between 3 and 4 p.m., right? Now, they, now, I'm calling them back. They wanted me to call them back, right? So you still do what they want you to do, right? You, they want you to call them back. So you still say, you know what? I'll call you back. No problem. I'll call you back, okay? And when I call you back, I'll call you back on Thursday, and I'll, I'll call you back to remind you of our appointment for, I'll call you back to remind you of, of everything for Friday, just to make sure you guys you know, are still good, something like that. So that's scheduling tip number eight, you know, on there. And that's a whole nother, another tangent, right? But when we get people, we got to book them on the first time we call them, okay? And then the next time we call them, if they need to reschedule, that's cool. But I'd rather reschedule an already set appointment than have to set the appointment to begin with, you know? It's a lot easier that way. And then I'll move them around three or four times on my schedule. That's fine. But at least you got them set that first time rather than every time you're calling them, you still haven't booked them. Does that make sense? So just a little side note on that. You know, so we know that, you know, when we're making phone calls. We're booking pretty much, you know, about uh, one per hour, about one out of 30. We're talking the one, uh, one out of 15 calls and we're booking one out of two talk tos. OK, so if you know those numbers to get 20 appointments booked on the phones, it's going to take us about 600 phone calls at 30 phone calls. That's going to be about 20 hours of calling about 20 hours of calling. Okay. So if you put in those 20 hours of calling, what are you going to get? 20 hours. How many, how many calls per hour can we make? 20 hours of calls times what? 30 hours equals 600 hours, right? You make 600 or 600 calls. I'm sorry. 20 hours at 30 calls per hour, 30 calls per hour, you make 600 calls. We know that we're setting right now, we're setting one for every 30 calls. We're talking to one out of 15. It's taking us two talk to's to get one set. This is talk to. We're talking to one out of 15 calls. We're setting one out of 30. We're setting one out of two talk to's. One set for every two talk to's. That's primarily what leads primarily what leads. So one way you could edge these numbers, obviously, is what? Referrals. referrals, you know? So knowing the numbers on referrals will help you play that game as well. So we'll dive into that here in a second. But this is the statistics, these are the numbers. So knowing this, how many sets should you get for the week? 20, right? 600 calls, 20 hours, 20 set, essentially one set per hour. Some times, some people here, it'll get seven set in two hours. So this is just average. Referrals, calling referrals when they're hot. Also calling leads. Some people are better at calling leads than others. Some people are better on the phone. They're better at smiling and dialing. So the people that um, are able to make more phone calls an hour, because not everybody makes 30 phone calls an hour. Some people lollygag, right? Some people do paralysis by analysis. They'll stare at the leads and like, who knows what they're looking at. And then some people will get in that phone zone and they'll make 33 phone calls an hour, 35 calls an hour. And when they catch people on the phones, their heightened abilities, they're just a little bit better on the phones. So they're booking at a higher rate, right? So those people are booking two per hour. They're booking two, they're calling more and calling better. So, so you can do more than one per hour too, but looking at the statistics, if you just wanna play statistics, does this make sense so far? So, right, so we gotta play at least 20 hours to get that done. That'll get you 20 sets. 20 sets gonna get you what? 
should have 10 seen, maybe nine seen, maybe nine presentations. So regardless, if you see nine or you see 10, typically what are you gonna enroll? Three, right? So that'll get us three enrollments. This is all running just leads though now. So three enrollments at what? $867 check. And uh, that would be 2,400 for the week and $1,200 in income. So then I go back to, all right, so if you make $1,200 for the week and you gave 10 presentations, so you hopped on a Zoom call with 10 families a week, right? How much are you making per hopping on Zoom calls? Every time you hop on a Zoom call, how much are you making? You're making $120 every time you hop on a Zoom call from your house, from your, from your, your home office, you know, from, from the office. Just hop on a Zoom call twice a day, you know? I wouldn't be enough. Six days a week? Yeah, that'd be enough. Yeah, five days a week. What? Hold on. Are you kidding me? <laughs> so literally like five days a week, you can hop on two Zoom calls a day. And that's what, how many Zoom calls? Ten. And you're making a buck 20 a Zoom call? All right. Now, now, you, there's, what? You guys should be given way more than 10 presentations a week. You don't even got to drive anywhere. You don't got to drive anywhere. I was doing 20 presentations a week. My, my mornings, every morning from eight o'clock until noon, I was in the office doing interviews and, 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 and training people. And then from like noon till one, I would meet my trainee. Maybe me and Marissa were training for the day. So Marissa, I'd be like, all right, Marissa, you got to watch these film. You got to role play with Brian all morning, right? Put that stuff on film. I'm going to be interviewing. So I got to do this, 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 and this, right? Okay. So you train with him. You do that. I'll meet with you at noon. Okay. As soon as noon comes, I literally, I run a group. So I'm in here pouring my heart out, running a group, selling the opportunity to 30, 40, 50 people in a room, telling everybody about that. Then I walk out of the room, all right, grab my lunch. Marissa, hey, how's it going? Let's work up. All right. So now we work on watching her video and we eat lunch at the same time. Then we hop in the car, right? Hey, you got all your stuff? I get all your stuff, grab your lunch and everything. Okay. We're not stopping today. Uh, I grab my lunch, you know, and uh, we, we literally hit the road, right? We had a good hour and a half ride to Uniontown or Johnstown, wherever I had to go. So then I drive all the way there. And uh, on the way there, we would be role playing, practicing, listening to stuff on, on tape, you know, and I say, all right, Hey, today in this first presentation, you're going to be going over the no cost benefits. Okay. Child safe this morning. When I heard you do the child safe, you did it perfectly, okay? okay? The only thing is you, you said this instead of this. So I want you to work on using this word instead of that word, okay, when we're doing this, all right? Other than that, I'll pick up from there. If you feel comfortable doing some of the AIL Plus card, the health benefit card, you know, feel free to keep running with that. And I'm not gonna say a word until, you know, you feel like you, I need to jump in there, right? But you're ready to rock this. And then, you know, I'll, we'll pick up at the end. I want you to help out with the E app, okay? So make sure your E app's fired up. Boom, 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 boom. Let's go over our schedule for today. And that's our ride out into the field. And I'd be riding out into the field for an hour and a half and we give four or five presentations that day. You know, two before five, two after five, no matter what. You know, first presentation was between two, three o'clock. Next one was between maybe four or five o'clock. And then we had like a six or seven, maybe a seven or an eight. And then last of the house, we were knocking on the door, 8.30, 9 o'clock at night. My last appointment was between nine and 10 o'clock at night. So I could get there at, eight, at 9.58 if I wanted to, you know, and we were still good. And that's why you could ask Gio, ask Gio what he used to walk around with. Anybody know what Gio used to walk around with? Gio used to walk around with a vest, like a construction vest with neon that like when lights hit it, you know, it had that like 3M type of effect, yeah. right? And when he would knock on people's door at nighttime, he'd have a vest on so people could see him. He'd have his thing out, you know, he had a clipboard that had a light built into it, you know, it's clipboard with his light on. So they seen him in his vest and his thing. Imagine him knocking on your door at 930 at night here, here to drop off your prison, your, your benefits, right? That's where we were. And then at, at then, then his area was an hour and a half away. So he didn't get out of the house till 11 o'clock. You know him, he takes forever. So he don't get out of there till 1130, you know, and, uh, and he don't get home till one o'clock. And he's training Marissa. How do you think Marissa's first week's going? Pretty good. She's like, oh, 
I don't know if I could do this. <laughs> right? Any of you guys having to get home at 1 o'clock at night from the field? You know what it's like. But not really. If you're in virtual, I mean, I'm, to be honest, I might see like 10% of people here like running the field right now. 90% of people are virtual, right? So with that being said, 10 presentations a week, three sales a week, 2,400, like I just don't, I feel like this is a pretty acceptable expectation for anyone to just like, you can't go through the motions. You got to zone in and focus, you know, but if you just punch in these numbers, I feel like this is the basis of everything. From here, you can go up or down now. If you're a little bit off with your closing ratio, if you're a little bit off with your show ratio, if you're a little bit off with your ALP per sale, if you're a little bit off with your uh, talk tos, the calls, the set ratios, if you're off with all those a little bit, yeah, at the end, your ALP might, might, be, might be 1,000 ALP for the week because you just keep going off and off and off and off and off. But if you can increase and have a better talk to ratio, you know, you can have a better show ratio, you have a better closing ratio, you have a better ALP per sale. Because what I mean, we're talking about closing one out of three. That's 33%. We're 40% in the agency. Our, our agency is 40% right now. You know, um, what, is, what is the uh, average ALP per, per lead is over 110 ALP per lead. So that, that's saying that if somebody has a uh, hundred leads, they're typically doing 10 to 12,000 or 10 to 11,000 off of those, right? So anyways, going back to um, the numbers, what if we increase this now? Cause you're like, well, I don't wanna give 10 presentations a week. You wanna give what? 20 presentations a week, right? Well, you got two options. We could double down on all the numbers Right, or we can start running referrals. And when you run referrals, we don't have to double the numbers in order to double the results. Okay, so let's say that you focus on the minimal number of referrals collected per week, which is 30. Okay, what kind of results is that going to get you? My number is 60, first of all, we should, we should be, but like the minimum for anybody to even be in the game, like to even like say like you came to play this week and you participated to get a participation trophy in the referral game, I guess you could call it. Uh, it's 30 a week just to like get in there, you know, now to compete, you know, to be competitive, it's like 60, 60 will get you competitive but we'll use 30 first, okay? The way it'll work is if you collect 30 referrals in the week, which means if you give 10 presentations, how many are we collecting? Three per presentation. So some may give you six, some may give you two, some may give you none. I got none before. You're not the first person that literally got shut down and got no referrals, right? Um, but, that didn't stop me from the next house running the same exact play. I said my referral script to this client and it got me nowhere, right? Then I said my referral script to this client, same exact thing. And they were like all over it. She's like, oh yeah, plus, you know, I run a daycare. And she, she opens up her phone book to me, gives me 32 families that I need to get these kids out to today. How did I run that over there? It didn't work. Then I run it over here and it worked, you know? So you don't uh, uh, abandon the referral script. You don't abandon the referral collection. When I see an agent at the end of the week, if I see that they didn't really have that good of a closing ratio, but then I also see they didn't collect any referrals, that basically tells me they didn't do the script. And no wonder they didn't close because they weren't... Did, they weren't doing a script because I guarantee you if they did the script and said the words, they just said those words, I guarantee you they would have got eight presentations, three referrals. 
there's no way that they're doing the script and saying the script. It's impossible. And if that's the result that our script is getting our people, we need to shut the operation down, okay? And, and, not, and, and go back in the back room with me and Gio and Josh and all the leaders, and we need to come up with a better script and get them in the hands of our people and equip them with some better words to say. Because if the words that we're teaching people to say are getting them eight presentations and three referrals, I'm not having that. That never happened under my watch. I've never in my life have ever gotten results like that saying the words I say. So either they're not saying the words I'm saying or the words I'm saying are extinct and there are better words that need to be said right now. We need to go find them ones and start using them. You guys know what I mean? So why would somebody give eight presentations and collect three referrals? What do you think it is? Is it the people are all crazy? The leads are bad. My leader didn't buy me lunch. What do you think it is? Why would you give eight presentations to get three referrals? Why would that ever happen? You're not doing the script. You're not saying the words that we're saying to, to, to say, you know? So I'm telling you, I'm just telling you. So anyways, um, but if you get, every time you do it, you're not gonna get, but here's what happens though. You run the play, it doesn't happen, right? So you just abandon it and you stop doing it. That's typically, and you, it, it's like a, you know, referrals is like your running game in football. You know, and they say, you don't wanna what? Abandon the, you don't wanna abandon the run. You have to establish the run. But the first time you run the ball, that you got stuffed at the line of scrimmage, you got one yard, right? Do you stop running the ball the rest of the game? Heck no, right? What will happen is you're gonna run three more plays and then you're gonna run that same exact play that you just got one yard on, okay? And you're gonna catch them and you're gonna get 15 yards on that same exact play, right? You're gonna run the same play, but you're gonna run it to this side. You're gonna get five yards. But the running game, at the end of the day, you only got three yards of carry. That's not a horrible day running the ball. Not horrible, you know, not the best. But if you ran the ball all week and all you got was three referrals per home, you did 10 presentations, you got three referrals per home, you just ran the ball, just run the play. Some of them you're going to bust through and you might get five referrals in a home, you know? and you coach and you push and you keep going by saying, okay, two down, we got eight more left, who's next? Five left, who's next? Okay, we got three down, okay, seven more left, who's next? Count them down to 10, you know? When they get to 10, you could, you, you know, I, we used to do, be creative, man. You get to 10, you're like, well, what are we gonna do now, right? I'll say, well, uh, the one family was only able to think of five members to get their kits out to. So actually, um, there's like there's extra five kits that they were able to sponsor that you can sponsor as well. So if you have some additional families, because I know we wanted to go all the way through the through your your phone list there, uh, let's let's make sure we, you know we get another five. So five we could get five more. And who would be the next person? You could use that, right? Um, uh, or I'll, I'll say, uh, I'll, you can get them competitive. You can say, you want to know what? The rec you, know, you already got 10? Might as well just go for the record. I don't know how competitive you are, but the record for the week is actually 17. Uh, the, the lady that I met with yesterday, uh, she was so excited about these kits. Um, she, she literally wanted to get them out to everybody at, at her whole school. We had, she ended up getting 17 families. So I don't know if you want to be able to try and beat her. And then when they hit 17, you say, well, the record for the month is actually 27. So I don't know how competitive you are, but if you want to go for the record for the month, uh, it was actually literally the, on, on, on March 3rd, I met with this lady, you know what I'm and boom, she gave me 27 families, her and her husband combined, you know? So I don't know if Mark, you want to go through your phone well and help her out a little bit. She's doing all the work over here, you know? How's your back doing? You, you know, you're carrying him on this whole, the whole operation. You know, and then you get them competitive and that's how you break one for 27, 37 yards. And that's how you're running back average five, six yards of carry for the week because you got that one bust through. It all takes one big run to change the whole entire 
um, average yards per carry and blow the whole game up. You know, I'm telling you, right? So, um, so we got to start pushing. We got to start stretching a little bit, guys. I don't think we're even pushing. Uh, number one, I, I think some of us abandon the run sometimes. I think you get into the house and you're just abandoning the run when that, that's, that's the play call. If you're, you run a football game, there's a reason why you establish. And then when you establish the referrals, guys, you're also establishing trust. The guy just gave me 27 names. You think he's going to have an issue giving me his bank account information? No way. So you think the more referrals you get, the, the worse it, or the hard, like it's more. No, the more referrals I get, the more confident and comfortable I start telling myself like, all right, he gave me 17 names. He gave me seven names. Dude gave me three names and his brother and his sister were, were two of them. He got to trust me a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Right? So the more names that I get, the more I like, it like fuels me a little bit, you know, and it should to you as well. It's a good sign, isn't it? It's a great sign that they trust you and that they like you, you know? So, you know, ask yourself, are you referable? Are you a referable person? Am I worth a damn, right? Do I have something of value, right? If they referred me to their friends and family, what would I bring to the table? In fact, I am the best damn thing that they could ever possibly refer to their family, ever. They're gonna go to a restaurant and say, go get these crab legs. What the hell are they telling their family about the crab legs for, but they won't tell them about you. They're going to go watch a TV show. Oh, my God. My, every time I see my mom, she got a new TV show for me to watch. You watch this uh, show uh, called uh, what's, Dancing with the Thr or what's Dancing with the Snow? It's Thrones. Game of Thrones. Do you watch a Game of Thrones? I'm like, no, I never watched a Game of Thrones. She's like, yeah, you got to watch it. I'm like, I don't got time for that. Then she said, next time, she's like, you got to watch the show um, Ozarks. Oh, you got to watch the Ozarks. Oh, I don't have time for that. You got to watch the show Yellowstone. She always got these shows for me to watch, right? Like people, that's just my mom. How many other people are out there recommending stuff to their friends and family all the time? All the time. As soon as they see something good that they like, you, out of all the stuff that they ever recommend to their friends and family, you know, I'm thinking like there's not many things that are this important. You know, you are one of the best possible things that they could ever refer. And you're the, and how about this? You're sitting with Joe and Mary, their brother and their sister and their cousin and the guy that their cousin works with desperately needs someone like you to call them and get them life insurance. And they're actually going to give you their name. They're going to, and they're going to give you their name, but you never ask, right? There's a lot of opportunity that gets left out on the table from us just not asking. Uh, they did a study one time. They said that the majority of non-sales, how about that? So you know how we're in sales. People go out there and they try and sell something to somebody. They try and sell something, okay? What, what, let's take all the people, all the non-sales, all the people that never bought, right? What's the number one reason why those people did not buy? Trust. Trust? Number one reason why those people didn't buy? Urgency. Urgency. You won't believe it. You, I swear you won't believe it. I didn't believe it. I still don't believe it, you know, but this is what I've heard. I've seen the statistic out there, you know, it's what people have said. So, you know, I, I can't give you the resource, but they say it's because they ne ne never got asked. They never got asked to buy. That's why I didn't buy most non-sales because they didn't even get asked. I don't know how that happens. <laughs> Hopefully that's not happening here. I don't think it would ever happen here. You know, we should always be asking the client for their business, right? But that's like someone doing a presentation, giving them their no cost benefits and then be like, okay, have a great day and getting off the call with them, you know? So, uh, so anyways, the number one reason why, you know, we don't collect referrals is because what? We don't ask. We don't ask. It's not because we're asking the wrong way. It's because we don't ask. So remember now, it's not, it's not do you know, right? It's who do you know? Big thing. So, so number one, we got to get asking. But when we got to ask, we got to make sure we're doing it the right way. 
And we don't want to throw out yes or no opportunities for the client. When you say, so do you know anybody that you want to get these kits over to? Right? You want to say, who do you know that we need, that we need? So you're saying, um, who, you're saying, do you know anyone that you want, right? Do you know, do you know, do you know anyone that you want, you know, to get these kids over to versus saying we need? So you say, who do you know that we need to make sure has these kids in place for their family? Now, most people start from their cell phones and you typically we could go from the A's to the Z's since you have your cell phone out. Why do they have their cell phone out? Anybody know why they have their cell phone out? Yeah, because we said, hey, why don't you get your cell phone? I have a very important number I need to put in here for your child safety program. Go ahead, pull up, maybe put under contacts under C for child safety kit. And here's the number. If you ever need new kits, get them lost, stolen, or if any of your friends or family members need a kit as well, they can always give this number a call. Just want to make sure you have that, you know. And for you, Joe, have one for you as well. And I make sure to have them both out, right? So then obviously they have their cell phone out. So then later, like a couple, couple minutes later, we go back around and we say to them, right, so Joe, now, now everybody, what they typically what my, what everyone does, they go from their cell phones, from their A's all the way down through the Z's. That way they don't miss anybody, especially the important people that they need to make sure we get these out to. So Joe, who will be the first person? I, well, I know that you said the kids, they they go over uh, is your mom's house a lot, right, Marissa? The kids are always over your mom's house, and she lives, you know, right around the corner up up the street there, right? So um, we're going to definitely want to make sure that she has some child safety kits for, for uh, over at her house. Okay. So we'll get your mom. What's your mom's first name? Okay. It's Martha. Okay, great. What's your, what's your, what's your dad's name? Steven. All right. Perfect. You know, we'll make sure we get the kits over to your mom next. All right. Now who would be the next person? Did you say your, your sister or what was that your sister, Brian? How many kids does your sister have? Two. Okay. Perfect. So we'll make sure we get two over to your sister. What was her name again? Jill. Okay. Perfect. Jill. And then that's a local one. Is that an 847? 847. Okay. What was that? 847? 321. Okay. Perfect. Two more down. Okay. We got eight more left here. Uh, who will be the next family that you want to make sure we get these kids out to? Did you say you were coaching the baseball team this year? Blah, 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 whatever. Who, who's coming over for Easter? You said you're having a big Easter party. I've seen the Easter, Easter, doing Easter egg hunt. Where are all the kids coming over for Easter egg hunt? You know, so what's whatever's going on there? Um, good questions to ask or things like that. You know, what's going on? Like a birthday party. If you had a birthday party for the kids, who would be some of the kids? That you, who would be some of the other kids you'd invite over for the birthday party? You know, whatever. Um, using things like what they want us to do. They want to make sure, you know, uh, when school lets out, they want to make sure that we have all the kids in place before school lets out. You know? Uh, now that now that things are opening back up, you know, they, they want to make sure that we have all these kits in place now before everything opens back up and it's going to be harder to, 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 to get them in place when everybody's moving around. And then during the summer, you know, what you say as soon as summer opens, you say uh, over summer, they need us to get these all back in place before uh, school goes back, before the kids go back to school. Summer's a, one of the, uh, summer's a spike in, in child abductions. You want to also spike? School. Going back to school, easy targets. So they need to make sure that we have kids in place for that. And then trick-or-treating is coming around. So when school starts, you tell them before trick-or-treating happens, they want to make sure we get all these kids in place. And then they say, guess what happens after that, guys? We're coming up on the end of the year. Okay, they need to make for 2021. We need to make sure we have all the kids in place for the end of the year for 2021. So we don't have to worry about, you know, this, these, these families going into the next, into the new year. Right. And then to the new year right now, what we can talk about will be what before springtime comes around before Easter, before, you know, before whatever you want to say, before the springtime comes around and, and people start going out and about boom.
before school lets out, just use the next six months for the next before school lets out first five months of the year, basically before school lets out. So I use these different things. You're going to drop them in there. That's not the main reason why you're there. That's not the, the, the bulk of your presentation. That's just a little line. You could slip in there to add a little bit more urgency to why you're doing what you're doing and why we're making these attempts to get as many child safety kids out as possible just helps explain it and logically makes a little bit more sense to the client as well. So all that stuff right there is going to help with, with, you know, referrals, but that's not the end all be all. That's a whole nother workshop that we can go into about collecting referrals and the ins and outs and everything that, that goes in. It's a mindset. You got to understand what's on the line and there's a lot of money with the referrals. So um, if you collect 30 referrals, here's what's going to happen. How many of them are you going to set? Okay, right now, if you collect 30, how many are you gonna set? You, you will set typically one out of three. So like 10 maybe, 10, nine. And if you set 10, how many are you gonna see? Five, maybe four. How many sales are going to get you? One or two sales? One or two sales? Well, now, if you're setting 20 leads a week and you're setting 10 referrals a week, now you're gonna be able to set 30 appointments. You'll give 15 presentations. Closing ratio on referrals though is, is gonna be higher, right? So this should get us now 15 presentations and a minimum of five sales at 800, which would be 4,000. ALP for the week. If we start setting less leads, more referrals, then obviously the numbers go down. So we have to maintain still setting the leads and then the referrals, we're getting 10 referrals set. These referrals set are not taking the same amount of time that it takes to set these leads up here. If you're rolling them from the home, how long does it take to set a referral when you roll from the home? Five minutes, five minutes, you know? So the time and the money that you make is, is, is ridiculous with this. Um, let's think about how, how long it would take to set 10 referrals. I think it would take probably at least half the amount of time it would take to set a normal lead, at least half. I'd say even more, 20 minutes, 20 minutes when you're calling lead referrals. So you could probably set three referrals an hour, three referrals an hour. And, and that's, well, let's look here. You know, you, you collect 30. Well, I'm not even gonna go into that. So if we set three referrals per hour to get 10 referrals set should take us three to four hours of calling three to four hours of calling is going to equivalent to uh 10 set five scene one to two cells let's say on two cells that's going to be 1600 1600 will pay us 800 dollars and we gave five sits. So how much are we making per sit there? Is that still the same? Eight hundred dollars over five sits. Yeah, it's it's about one sixty a sit, one sixty. So you're making one hundred and sixty dollars a sit versus one hundred and twenty dollars a sit. And then over here. For the sets, for the sets, we're making, what is this? $80 a set. 
over here, 1200 for 20 set means you're getting what? $60 a set. So when you're running the referrals, the, the, the amount of money that we make per hour and the amount of money that we make per sit and the amount of money we make per set goes up. We just figured right here on a small scale that a referral is paying us 160 per presentation where a, a lead is paying us 120 per presentation. So on a weekly basis, if, if, if you give 10 presentations a week, it's gonna take you the same amount of time to give 10 presentations a week in leads. And it's gonna take you the same amount of time to give you 10 presentations a week in referrals, but the referrals is gonna pay you at least a third more, one third more in this situation we're showing here. You make 1600 versus 1200 just by sitting down with referrals. And actually it'll take less time because you're not gonna have to make as many phone calls to get as many booked. And, and really uh, when you get to the presentations, that's where the closing ratio goes up and that's how it makes up for everything. The ALP per sale on referrals typically not that, not that much higher, not that much higher. It's just the closing ratio on the referrals is, is a lot higher, a lot, a lot, a lot higher. So that's why you want to sit in front of them, you know, and if we go into an hourly, you know, what are, what, what are we making over here, guys? If you make $1,200 for the week, you gave 10 presentations, you're making what? 120 per sit. Okay, great. Well, uh, 120 per sit, so 60 per set, 60 per set, and um, 60 per set. And then how many people did I talk to this week? I talked to 40 people in order to get 20 sets. So I'm making $30 a talk to. So every time someone answers the phone, I make $30, right? $30 a talk to. And because I talked to 40 people. And in order to talk to 40 people, I had to make 600 phone calls. Talk to, is that right? Yeah. yeah. So think about that. Every time someone answers the phone, you get paid $30 just for them saying hello, right? When they agree to meet with you, or they say, yeah, I'll meet with you tomorrow. And you're like, all right, great. And you write their name down. You could write their name in the next to it, put $60. You just made 60 bucks for writing their name on a sheet of paper. 60 bucks every time you write a name on a sheet of paper, you know? So knowing those numbers really helps because now I know how can I get that numbers up? I want to always get them up. I don't want to be hitting the average 60. If the average is 60, how can I get them up? One way to do that without getting that better in any skill set, like one way to get it up, right, is, is have a better um, uh, show ratio. You know, one way is to um, uh, have a better close ratio, have better ALP per sale. You know, you can get those up. But another way to, to do it is instead of sitting down with leads, is just sit down with referrals. Say the same thing you said to this person, just say it to that person. And if this person's a referral and this person's a lead, the results will go up without you developing any skill set. You don't have to be any better, you know? So I always try to do all those intangible things that can help you win without you ever having to, you know, necessarily be any faster, be any stronger, you know, uh, at it. So, you know, like, um, wearing baby blue. They said wearing baby blue gives you a better chance of closing. Uh, that, that don't require any skills, does it? Doesn't require no skill set at all. You know, I could be the same exact closer I was yesterday, but I was wearing, you know, I don't know, whatever a bad color, brown or something. I don't know what, what they say, not the best color to wear would be, you know, but maybe I was wearing the not best color, red. I think red's actually not supposed to be the best color because it's like supposed to be stopped. But uh, Geo makes tons of cells wearing red, so he completely proved that theory wrong. Um, but, but, you know, mine was always baby blue. And maybe just mentally, it just made me think I was a better closer, you know? And that's all I really needed is just what my lucky socks, right? So, you know, uh, I don't know what really what it was, but um, things that you can do that are intangible that can help you get more success, uh, try to do them, try to do them. So... If you're collecting 60 referrals a week, what's that look like? 
that's it right there. 60 referrals a week. This is where, where life gets crazy. 60 referrals a week. That'll give you 20 referrals that you're going to sit down with on a weekly basis. I'm sorry that you're going to set. You're going to set 20. And if you set 20, you're going to see what? 10. You're going to see 10. And if you see 10 referrals, you're going to be closing 66 to 75 percent. So six to seven referrals. And then you go and see 10, 10 leads per week and you close three of them. Close three leads. So now you did 20 total presentations for the week and you closed nine to 10 of them. So average ALP, let's say 800. So you did, let's just say uh, 8,000 for the week. You did about 8,000 for the week. Now, what are we making per set? 8,000 at 20 presentations is what? You're making $400 a presentation now. Versus over here, we're making what? 120. The reason that, that, that this person's making 120 because the, all they're running is just the leads. That's it, right? This person is, is, is doing half and half. So if you could get a half and half mixture, that's when you'll start to generate this $400 per presentation. Now you're going to be like, now how many presentations can I give a week? You know, you were excited like, man, if I could give every time I just get onto a Zoom call with somebody, I'm making a buck 20, right? Now, every time I can get onto a Zoom call with somebody, I'm making 400. Think about that, right? Is that right? 400 ALP, ALP. So you're making $200. That's right. You guys didn't correct me on that. So this is the money. This is the ALP. Because you're going to write 8,000 ALP for the week. So if you write 8,000, what are you going to make? 4,000, right? And if you're given 20 presentations and you make $4,000, then you're making about $200 per presentation. You know, so that's, that's, that's what we're off. I knew something was crazy. So 200, does that make sense? Okay. So then on top of that now, um, if we're making 200 per presentation, how much are we making every time somebody agrees to book with us now? $100. Because we end up uh, making... 20 referrals set and we made 20 leads set. So we had 40 appointments set for the week. 40 appointments set, 40 appointments set. That's basically running 10 appointments set four days a week or eight appointments set five days a week. What's eight appointments look like on a schedule? Eight appointments look like on a schedule. map that out. So here we go. We're good over here. We know that we know all these numbers. These are just numbers. You can't argue with them. One plus one is two. 20 uh, leads, 20 referrals set, 40 set. We're making how much per appointment that we book? $100. $100. And um, that's a book. So before we schedule somebody, we got to what? We got to talk to them. So just for getting somebody on the phones, we're getting what? $50 for someone to say, hello. Right? That's pretty good. So knowing those numbers uh, are good. All right, how do we map out this time now? Okay, well, if I got a gift, uh, I'm looking at eight set per day, eight set per day, four sits, right? So two ways you break it down. Sits, if I have to give four sits in a day, I have to see two people before five, two, 
after five. That's what you want to schedule up. So here's my eight appointments. You can have a two to three. Do you guys book them on the hour or every hour or, or like two hours? You're, you're saying two hours? Okay. You do one hour for Zoom? So I'll say, all right, so Joe, I'll see you tomorrow between 2 and 3 p.m. Please let your wife know, blah, blah, blah. All right, all right. So 2 to 3, 3 to 4, 4 to 5, 5 to 6, 6 to 7, 7 to 8, 8 to 9. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 to 10. There's your eight appointments book right there. Then I would take eight until 10, six until eight, four until six, two until four. And you can set, some people call them floaters or bridges, call them a bridge appointment. And basically it's a third appointment that you book over them to two hour time gap. Right. This would give you 12 appointments scheduled for that day. We don't need that many. We really don't. So you can literally have a two to three or or a three to four. OK, you can have a four to five or a five to six. You'd have a six to seven or a seven to eight. You could have an eight to nine or a nine to ten and then have a bridge that's two hours and have the two to four, the four to six, the six to eight, and the eight to 10. That's what I would tell my booker to get me if I, if I had to give four presentations for you. I would tell him to book all the times up for me. But I knew if I caught at least the two to three or this, guess what I'm gonna, between these, this area, I'll, I'll at least give one presentation. Over here, I'll at least give one presentation. Over here, I'll at least give one presentation. And hey, I don't even care if I don't give no presentations in any of these because over here, I'm going to give my presentation. And this is prime time. And give me four prime time presentations a week and I'll walk out with three sales no matter what. So as long as you're given four prime time presentations a week, which is Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Friday night, Saturday morning, eight. Got to have an eight in it, you know, like an eight, 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 to, eight to nine p.m. or eight to nine a.m. Those are like prime time appointments, you know? So uh, schedule wise, you know, we should go hard during the week. And I mean, Saturday nights, you guys should be going to dinner, going to movies, hanging out with your family, cooking dinner, uh, whatever. Going out to the club, going to a concert, whatever, you know? <laughs> Is there any other Uh, statistically, they, they, they call it prime time for a reason, obviously, you know what I mean? If there was a, if, if it was better for us at 2 p.m. to make sure, I, I, hey, prime time will be 2 p.m. I don't overthink things, you know, it's just statistically the best time uh, for us to close is it, is it, is that, is it 9 p.m.? Um, families are asleep, families got the kids, the kids are in a bed, you know, they can focus more. If people are willing to meet with you and talk to you at that time, they're more calm, there's less distractions. That's just all things that I observe, observe you know, and, and I've at least told myself, you know. <laughs> um, Saturday mornings are good because Friday was their last day at work. You know, Friday nights are usually pretty good because they just got off work. <sighs> you know, they're relaxed, their mind's at ease. You know, um, Saturday mornings are good because they just got paid Friday night. Um, their minds are ready to spend money. If they don't spend money with you, in fact, before you got there, they already planned on going to buy a new gun that day. They already planned on going to Dick's that day. They already planned on getting some new hunting gear. They planned on getting some new golf clubs. They already planned on signing up for the golf club. They already planned on taking their kids and signing them up for this. They already planned on that. They already, before you got there on a Saturday, they already had planned on going to Home Depot and buying fertilizer. They already spent money before you got there. You understand they're ready to spend money. Saturday mornings is like, 
They want to spend money. They're looking to spend money. Just give them a reason to spend some money and they're going to spend some money, right? So that's what we got to do though, is we got to hustle up, man. We got to get in front of them and we got to give them a reason. You know, don't, don't forget, man, we got, we got uh, three things, right? What did I, we, got, we got a place to be. We got a reason to be there and we got a story to tell. You know, and obviously we got a damn good st story to tell. So you got to be masters of, 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 of telling that story you know, telling that story. If you remember, telling's not selling either. So we don't go into a home and just talk, 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 talk. Look how smart I am. Look at, I could tell you this and this and this and this and this. And oh yeah, 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 this and that, 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 that. And you just talk and talk. If you keep talking at the client, it, telling is not selling. You could tell them everything in the world. Tell them how smart you are. Tell them how great the company is. Tell them why they need it. Tell them this, tell them that. They ain't gonna buy nothing, okay? Conversations, you gotta have conversations and question asking. So the right people like the right the top sales people they get the right answers because they're asking the right questions so you got to remember you know when you're in the home don't just get consumed with just trying to tell them everything slow down be compassionate listen to them when they give you a rebuttal it's not even a rebuttal it's literally they they don't get it and they ask a question and you're thinking that they're trying to like come up with a smart aleck rebuttal like they have, like they think this is like some sort of sales game and they were sitting there all day with their husband game planning it out. Like, hey, honey, if he hits us with this, we're going to play, we're going to play dumb. Okay. And then we're going to, then we're going to slide in. All right. And I'm going to, I'm going to throw it over to you. And then you're going to hit him with this. Like they didn't know nothing. They're, they're, they're not salespeople. They're not salespeople. They're not prepared for nothing. And that's what I get upset sometimes when we get sold by, by people who aren't even professional salespeople. You're the professional salesperson. Don't forget that. You're the professional salesperson. They don't have no skills in selling at all. They have no business selling nothing. But at the end of the day, they just sold you on why they don't need it, why they can't afford it, and why they need to think about it. All three of them. Like I could understand getting sold by one, maybe, but you can't get beat by all three. How are they selling you on when you walk up to the door? You're like, hey, um, you know, my name's Tom V, North American. I'm going to take care. Of you. How much time is this? I don't have any time. And you're like, oh my god. They don't have any time and you immediately buy what they just, they just literally sold you a bunch of baloney and you bought it like that, right? If you're going to buy something, don't buy baloney, <laughs> you know, buy something a little bit better than that. And this is what they tell you when you walk in the door. I promise you the first thing they hit you with is just some stuff. And, and you got to remember before you, sometimes you ever tell yourself like, you know, uh, I'm not, I'm not buying nothing from these people. I don't care. I'm not, I'm, I'm the one selling here, you know, and then look yourself in the mirror and tell yourself that say, you know, I'm not taking no for an answer. I'm not, I'm not buying anything what they tell me, you know, I'll listen to them. I'll listen to them. I'll understand. I'll even agree with them. I'll even agree with them, but I ain't buying it. You know, I will agree and proceed. So, you know, that they're going to say, and, and, and it happened to me so many times where a client says, how, how much time is this going to take? I don't got a lot of time. I got to be somewhere. Like how many times did they try to rush me? And a few times I bought it. So I sped up my presentation and I didn't give them the proper service that I gave all my other clients, you know, and I shortcut stuff. I wasn't myself, sped up things, maybe miss some things, cut some things out. Didn't give them the whole thing. And, uh, and I found out really at the end that they didn't have really nothing even going on. I sped it up for no reason. Like, are you serious right now? You're going to Walmart? I thought you had to be somewhere. Walmart's open 24 seven. Do you know? That was a real thing. I literally was driving home. I was like, Walmart's open 24 seven. Walmart's open 24 seven. Walmart's open, they don't close. Tommy. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like that was, that was a rough pill for me to swallow. But then I also saw on the other hand where somebody told me they needed me to rush and I didn't rush. I said, we'll get there. Watch this video. I made her watch the videos and do everything. Right. At the end, uh, she ended up enrolling, getting her husband covered who needed it desperately. Right. And, um, she was telling me, yeah, her and her sister were, were, uh, they were going shopping. They were going shopping. And I was telling to myself, I'm so glad that I didn't speed up my presentation and I kept it real and I, I kept my feet on the ground, you know, and I, I stayed strong 
and I stayed in control because she wanted to just try and get that control, you know, and see if she, and I stayed in control. And by the end, I was able to control because at the end is when you need to have that control in order to get the enrollment. So, you know, if you don't establish that control is you're not going to get the enrollment. You're just not going to get it, you know? Um, so anyways, uh, don't, don't be buying the stuff when they, when you hop on, hop on those calls, you know? So anyways, we got this stuff going on here. Okay. This is how you can set up eight presentations in a day, right? Set between two and four, and then either set a two to three or a three to four. Yeah. You know, or just set two, two to fours. Just set two, two to fours. One of them will show up. And if they both show up and see the one from two to three thirty, and then at three thirty, hop in the next one. You know, you catch them both. But if you set eight appointments, you're going to have four that you don't see, and you're going to roll those to the next day. So you're always going to have momentum going when you start this this going. So that's where you want to be at eight presentations, set four per day, two before five, two after five. And if you want to get five presentations in in a day, you just kind of have to move a little bit quicker and get a couple a.m. ones in, lunchtime ones, a.m. ones, or, or a late night prime time. Because you can still see somebody between five and seven, someone between seven and nine, and you could still go catch your 10 p.m. super prime time appointment, okay? So you can still give five presentations. You don't only have to give two after five. You can give three after five, you know? So keep that in mind with, with the schedule. All right, so I'm gonna go over uh, last thing today and we'll break is gonna be um, just, we got some child safe leads that are being uh, out there now. And we're gonna be running a couple more child safes. And if you're collecting child safe referrals, regardless, you're gonna be running into families with kids, right? Families with kids or grandparents with kids, right? So one of the uh, coverages that we have is our Head Start program. The Head Start program. So I tell the clients, this is how I explain a Head Start program to a client. I'll say, so Joe and Mary, you know, our company has uh, what's called a Head Start program. And what this does, this allows parents and grandparents to put whole life coverage on their children. Typically, what would happen is you have to wait until you're 18 and you become age of majority before you can take out your own whole life policy on yourself. And what our company figured is when's the best time to get life insurance? What do you think, Joe? They found out is, is the best time is when you're young and when you're healthy. So uh, what they did is they developed a Head Start program that actually allows ch kids to have their own whole life coverage uh, uh, while, you know, at the youngest age possible. So uh, the way it works, Joe, is like this. And then I take the rate book. So if we had a rate book with me, you know, basically I would just say, you can imagine, I don't need one here to show you guys because it's pretty basic. What I'm going to say is I just take the rate book and I show them the rate book. And I say, if you see right here, uh, there's uh, the Head Start program, the way it works is it'll cover the child for $25,000 of whole life coverage. Now you can see that the, the male are listed in the black ink and then the females are listed here in the red ink. So for instance, your son is how old? Three years old. So for your son, Aiden, if you go to the three-year-old right here, okay, it's covered him for $25,000 of coverage, okay? And for that, it would be... Uh, I don't even know what the number is, $8 and, you know, 32 cents a month or whatever the number is, right? And that's how much the, 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 the coverage would be, all right? So what that'll do is no matter what, from now until forever, Aiden will always be covered for $25,000 of whole life coverage. And it, it could be today, tomorrow when he's 99 years old, and, and that money will always pay out to, to, to his family. Um, so then I say, now the way it's going to work here, Joe, is every month you're going to, the program is, it's, and, and I don't know if you have a rate book or not, I'm going to use stuff off the top of my head, okay? So every month you're going to put $8.32 into his program, 
okay? And the way the program's gonna work is when you put the money into, the, into his program, part of the money is going to pay for his cost of insurance. So part of it's gonna pay for his $25,000 of whole life insurance. But the other part is gonna be put into cash. And it's gonna build what's called cash value at 4% interest rate. So the way this will work for your son now is at age 65, this cash is going to be worth this. And then I show them in the rate book what the number says, right? I believe it's right around 12,000 or something. I'm just guessing. 12 or 13,000. So let's use 12,500. So basically, Joe, your son's three. So from age three to age 65 is how many years? 63, right? So let's take this 12,5 divided by 63. Alex, you got yours going there, it looks like. Do, do 12,5 12, divided by 62. 62 years and you know honest to god uh, i mess that up on purpose when i meet with clients all the time i'm like because i want them to correct me because i want them paying attention you know what i'm saying and I'll, I'll literally i'd be like so if he's 62 if we go 62 to 65 how many how many years is that is that 60 some right joe 60 some years what is it see how i do that with the client like just so you know it's a little thing I, i'm just trying to get through with this anyways but yeah so it's 62 years right joe right 62 so we would take 12 5 divided by 62 which is it's 198 and then that's 198 dollars a year so divide that by 12 would equal sixteen dollars and 53 cents okay so basically joe um, if you set aside $16 and 53 cents a month, every single month from now until age 65, you would have set aside how much? $12,500, right? So what this program is doing is on a monthly basis, you're going to, your cash value is growing by $16 and 58 cents a month. That's how your program's gonna work, okay? Now, every month, you're gonna only, you're gonna put in $8 into the program. So every time you put $8 into the program, what's the cash value growing by? 16, right? So when you look at like, what's the cost of insurance on this program? You're actually not paying anything for the cost of insurance. You're actually making $8 a month. Imagine this, imagine that we went to the bank today and we said we wanted to open up bank accounts for our kids. And uh, they said, you know what? You came on a great day. Uh, we have a special. And uh, every time you put $8 into a bank account, we're going to turn that $8 into $16. we are going to double it. Every single time you put $8, we will put $16 in there. Would you sign up for that bank account? Right? And say, oh, and on top of that, God forbid, if you passed away, we'll just turn the bank account into $25,000 for your kid. Would you, would you put that in there? Would you do, would you set that up for your kid for $2 a week? Right. Probably the best $2 a week we could set aside for our kids. You know, I tell them this is the best thing you could possibly do for your, your children. Now this is the way the program works for the children here. Okay. It's a great investment for them and it locks them in with their life insurance when they're young and when they're healthy, okay? Um, but the main reason why uh, our clients, why most parents even get this program is because this program comes with what's called a GIO. And that stands for Guaranteed Insurability Option. What that does is, is, is that when you lock in with the coverage today, your child is covered for 25,000 for the rest of their life, okay? But by adding this guaranteed insurability option, what it does 
is it guarantees insurability on your child for the future. So that no matter what, if your child were to ever grow up and, you know, let's just say, for instance, that, you know, my parents put this on for me, you know, and now I'm older, I got a, I got a wife, I have kids, and I say, you know what, I appreciate the $25,000, mom and dad. However, I need more coverage. It's not enough. If I, if I want to go get more life insurance for myself and I'm uninsurable, then no life insurance company is going to let me get any more coverage, right? But if my parents have this in guaranteed insurability on for me, it don't matter. I could be the sickest person in the world. It don't matter. When I'm older, I'm guaranteed insurable and I can add more coverage for my family. And the way it works, Joe, is that it allows you to add $25,000 up to six separate times. So I could literally be the sickest person uh, on my deathbed. If I could sign the papers, they're gonna guarantee to increase my life insurance for my family no matter what, right? So having the coverage is great for the family, for the kids. The investment portion of it, the way that the cash value grows for the children, um, it's one of the best things you could possibly do. But the biggest reason also is making sure that no matter what, we're guaranteeing our children to be insurable uh, basically for the rest of their lives. Does that make sense, Joe Mary? Okay. So for you, you know, and, and, and then for you, uh, what that would be, you know, it's $8 and then the guaranteed insurance is 167. So it's like $10 and 34 cents a month, you know, for them. So I would definitely recommend, you know, make sure we get that in place, you know, for them today, you know, whatever, and just lock them in real quick with that. Um, it looked like Matt Brown beat him by a second. <laughs> we had two hands go up really fast. Maybe it's the same hand question. <laughs> okay, hey, that'd be great. But, uh, um, is this, when you introduce this, um, is this uh, a second money situation? Like they just picked an option already for theirs and then you're introducing this as well. Where are you putting this into the pitch? Same question. Yeah, you know, um, yeah, you know, I would, if, if it was a single mom or something, I would show her, her, program how to protect but now i would also show her this for the kids you know kind of like almost at the same time you know if this was uh you know uh, focusing on the parents first and then showing them this second you could do, you could slide that in second as well right but if um if they're playing ball and i'm i'm i'm, I'm going over stuff with them i'll show them the parents and then I might put the head starts down at the bottom, you know, when I put up it on the screen there for them and just have it already prepared. You know, so if you know how old the kids are and stuff, already have these numbers wrapped up in your head, boom, it's a lot easier, you know, spit out to them. Um, always have this up your sleeve though, because if the parents aren't really buying for themselves or whatever, you know, you could always show the kids. They might, some people would rather get the kids than the parents, grandparents. Some grandparents, you know, you go in there for these will kits, guys, and they're like, well, I can't get no coverage. They don't want no more coverage. They can't afford no more, no more coverage. They already have their funerals taken care of. Well, they like you, you know, they understand how important life insurance is, right? You, you give them the whole pitch. You got to give them the whole pitch. It means you got to slow down. You got to take your time. You got to smile. You got to say, okay, so one thing I got to, I, I completely forgot to make sure I went over with you. Our company actually has this program, it's called the Head Start Program. And what it does for the kids, it, allow, it allows parents and grandparents to actually put whole life coverage on the children um, before they're even 18 years old. Because typically, you know, if I wanted to get whole life coverage, I would have to wait till I'm 18 and then I can get my own whole life coverage. So uh, what our company figured is when's the best, and you got to slow down and care and really explain it to them, you know, and, and, and let them know what's going on. Cause they don't know, they don't know. They don't know about the whole, I have people that work with this company right now. They don't even know about the Head Start policy, <laughs> right? How scary is that? They don't even know how the GIO works. So what do you think these people out here were beating with? 
they have no clue. So we got to bring it to them, educate them, let them know how cool was this, you know? So uh, explaining how it all works, you know, using the rate book, using the rate book, showing them the numbers, breaking this all down for them. Everybody know how to break these numbers down? This is, this is huge for selling um, Head Start policies because you show them how whatever money they're not that you don't add the GIO in. Did I add the GIO? The GIO is what it's 1030 with the GIO. I just showed the, the whole life coverage, right? For the 25,000, the premium for the coverage is $8 a month. So every time they put $8 a month into his policy, this is what's going on. After I get them bought in on all that, then I say, oh yeah, by the way, people don't even get the coverage. They don't even get this for that. All this is cool. They don't even get it for that. The reason that they get this is because it comes with a GIO. It comes with the GIO. That's the whole reason that they get the whole program. And the GIO is only a buck 67 a month or whatever it costs. So now I'm playing, now I'm playing the eight, eight dollars like it's nothing. You don't even care about the eight dollars. It's really about the 167. It's really about getting that GIO. You can't get the GIO though unless you got the way 832. You know what I'm saying? The $25,000 cool today, the cash value is great, but being insurable for another $150,000 guaranteed for the rest of your life is priceless. Ask the person who's 25 years old who has a wife and kids and they're insurable right now what they would pay. If, uh, I, there's not a not amount of money I would pay. It's priceless to me to have that ability to have life insurance for my family and I can't right now. Priceless, right? So the GIO, man, and all that, I, I sell the GIO harder than I even, I sold this hard as shit and then I sell this even harder than I even sold that and say, this is the main reason why we even get this is so you can get that, you know? It's the best thing. I mean, if you have, a, if there's a kid out there I don't know what, what else, what else can the parents put, you know, 10 bucks a month towards for their kids that's better than this. And that's real talk. Let's start listing them, <laughs> right? It's going to be a short list. What can they put $10 a month towards that's better than this? They probably put more money towards Cheerios on a monthly basis than $10. Cheerios, Frosted Flakes, what is it? Lucky Charms, Fruity Pebbles. Those are the things I hate when I see them in my closet. I like to see them because it makes me want to, but I don't need it, but I want to, but like I know my kids are, it's not good, you know? But anyways, Mason, speaking of some Fruity Pebbles, we got Bam Bam. <laughs> Bro, quick question. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, so what, what would happen if let's say the parents were paying this and then something happened to the parents. Would we get a call to where now the kids can just convert so that they can pay it for themselves or would it just cancel to now the kid, you know what I mean? Like what would happen if the parents were to die and, you know? Yes, yeah, so the, the kids would have to maintain the premiums. Well, uh, if they had a paid in for a long time, there might be cash value built up into it so that uh, if they didn't meet their premium payments, it would give them some time to get stuff situated, but they would have to pick up the premium payments um, from whoever their guardian would be, I guess. You know, I can't imagine a 10 year old pay out the premiums, but whoever the guardian is would have to pay that. And then as far as that happening, would we get a phone call saying that the parents have died that we're, we're going to have to contact the beneficiary or the, I know I'm getting into it. I just want it to be. It might prepared. not be a phone call. It might be a letter, you know, basically it might be a letter stating that, you know, little Johnny Smith policy is lapsed. Probably what would happen is we'd get a letter stating the policy was lapsed and we'd have to call them, find out what happened and get it fixed basically just get a new bank account update the bank information would be and it probably wouldn't even be a bad idea to tell the parents maybe hey if this were to happen you should put this in your will that if something happens to you you want your kids to be still being paid on your insurance yeah 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 family information guide free will kit all kind of goes hand in hand with all that too you know so 
Oh, good fire, bro. Fire. Good question. <laughs> good question. Good question. Any questions on the uh, anything right now? Child safe or whatever. Um, do, they, Go- do they take over ownership of the policy once they turn 18? Does it have a start or do the parents still pay? They do not uh, uh, take over ownership of the policy automatically. They have to do that. You know? Have accessibility to do that. Yep. 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 As soon as they turn 18, they can transfer ownership to the, to the, the, the child, you know, who's no longer a minor, the 18 year old can take over ownership of the policy. Um, so he'll be the owner and insured prior to that. The parents are the owner. The child is the insured, the owner and payer actually. So mm-hmm. owner and payer are parents. If you want to switch that when they're 18 owner and payer can be the child, you know? But that's something they'd have to switch over. So once they take ownership, uh, adult increments of twenty-five thousand dollars are still apply or can they increment to whenever, however, however much they want? So. Yeah, uh, regardless of who the owner is. So if the parents are the owners, you know, or the the the, the uh, child takes ownership of the policy, regardless of who the owner is, they the GIO stands as it is. So. Uh, they could increase by 25,000, you know, up to six different times, you know, regardless. And if you look in the rate book, it gives you the dates. I think it's like 25, 28, like 32, 34, and 36, or something like that. It gives you the ages of when they are eligible to do it. And they're also eligible to do it um, prior to that if they have kids or get married. So they don't have to wait till they're 25. Like, you know, if I had kids when I was 22, and I was really sick and I needed to get more life insurance, they'll let me increase it because I had kids and if I bought a house and stuff and I don't have to wait till I'm 25. I have a question, Tommy. Yes. Um, in terms of, in terms of like the Head Start and, you know, introducing that Head Start program, would you do that in the intro or before term and whole or when you are at like in the needs analysis on the screen? Yeah, well, the, the Head Start policy um, would definitely be something you, you would do towards the end after you've already met with them, you've established what we do, we're a good, credible company, they understand the difference between whole life and term, you know, because now you're, you're introducing a whole life policy. So I wouldn't want to introduce a whole life policy to them if they don't even know what a whole life policy is, you know, let's establish what that is, and then, you know, show them the details of it. A little bit more and the head start policy is great because the numbers usually work out pretty good pretty much in our favor now the same thing works for the select policies as you guys know right same thing works for select policies so you meet somebody with a select policy and dude when you bring this up this is just you educating a client you know because that this is where you, you might be like oh this is great knowledge but we don't use it because we're just not sure how to bring it up, right? That's like, oh man, I got a, 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 a great pickup line, but I'm not sure when, just say it. You're just not really the best. Don't say it at the beginning, don't say it in the middle, use this after you, you know, towards the end of a presentation, okay? But all you gotta do is just say, oh, you wanna know what? Let me tell you about this. Or, oh, I almost forgot to tell you. Or you don't wanna know what? This would be actually, what I'm thinking for you, for you guys, we actually have, this thing is called our Head Start program. Okay, you could even say they just came up with it, or they just revamped it, or whatever. You know that, but um, uh, it can, it would actually be perfect for you, and you have grandkids as well. Check this out. Here's how this works, right? And you just go into it and you get the concepts down that the best time to get life insurance is when you're young, when you're healthy, and boom, this is why they did it. And now you and you show them all this, and here's how it worked for you, and. It's just you being excited a little bit, having a little bit of enthusiasm, believing in what you're talking about. And, and really at the end of the day, you're not selling them nothing. You know, you're basically just explaining to them how our program works and they don't know how it works. So that's a pretty important job, you know? Cause if you get off that call and they don't know how it, it works, then you think about it, we just spent all this time with them and they don't really know nothing new than what they knew before. At least introduce some new ideas, some new products, some different um, uh, ways that they can protect their families, you know, that they didn't know about beforehand, right? And educate them a little bit, right? 
Uh, I have a question. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you answered it when you answered Alex's question or you said you didn't understand it. Um, so say the, the policy is on the kid, but the parents are paying it. If the kid wants to increase that GIO rate, they want to do that. Does that mean that the parents, because they're the owner of that policy, they're the ones that actually have to increase that coverage and be the owners of that policy? Or can the kid do it and the parents still be the owners of that original policy? It would all be the same policy. So it would be whoever the owner and the payer is. There's only one owner, one payer. There's only one owner, one payer. So they would have to do it through the parents. If the parents own the policy and they want to take advantage of the GIO, it would just, the parents would take uh, responsibility for the increase in payment on that, okay. you know? Sure. So, yeah. Just to follow up, this is real quick, just to follow up that question. I know you said that um, kids can only have like, uh, at least half of what the parent has, right? So in, in that case, how would that work if they wanted to add more? They would need to add more on themselves first? They're gonna be 25 at that point. So it don't matter. 25. They're gonna be 25 years old, 18 years old. By the time they wanna do the, the add, the, okay. Yeah, yeah, so they don't matter anymore. They're not a kid. Okay. Uh, in, in terms of the GIO, um, when you, like you, you're sitting down with the DOS, you see they have a GIO on them. Um, if they aren't at one of those ages where you can increase the GIO, do they stuff to, you know, obviously you would just introduce it as a regular program. You wouldn't even mention the GIO or- The only time you need a GIO, okay, is when you need to activate the guaranteed insurability option, yeah. right? And the only reason you would even need to activate your, to basically pull out the trump card, you know, to pull out the, yeah, I got my guarantee card here. What do you mean? Why would you need to prove that you're guaranteed? if you're not insurable, right? The only time you need the guaranteed insurability is if you're uninsurable. If they're healthy, if they're healthy, they could get as much coverage as they want and they could apply for, when they're 20, get 100, 100 grand. When they're 22, get another 50. When they're 28, get another 300. They could just keep getting more and more life insurance as long as they're healthy, you know? But the only time they would need to activate that is if they said, I want more life insurance. And the company's like, you're uninsurable. Like, well, no. I got my guaranteed insurability, right? Then you're like, all right, well, you have to wait till you're 25, 28, 28. And at these ages, we'll give you this $25,000 increase. And he's like, well, I'm 22 and I just had a kid. He's like, oh, well, then we'll just, we'll get to you now. And you can get the coverage increase now. I, I was kind of like suggesting it as more, it was more, it was more of like a sales technique. Like you have the GIO here. So what this means is you won't even have to ask any, answer any medical questions to qualify for more you automatically qualify, you know? That's, yeah, that's a good thing to educate them on, you know, to let them know, but um, yeah, I mean, that's just educating them, like I said, yeah. you know, and that's the best thing guys, if you're ever like, man, how can I, you know, sell this to the client, right? The best thing is don't try and sell it. Just think of how can I explain this to the client the way that it works the best? Cause that typically is gonna sell itself. It really does, the stuff sells itself you know, sells itself. So I think like if you met with a 30 year old and they got a hundred thousand, how much would they pay? $96 a month or something, right? So break the calculator out real quick, right? So they're paying $96 a month. And when you have a whole life pol policy, how's a whole life policy work guys? Part of the money goes towards what? Cost of insurance. The other part goes to the cash value, right? And the cash value grows at 4%. And then at age 65, in this situation, he's 30. He's going to have how much cash value? 36 or something? You guys know what the number is? Is it 32 or 36,000? I think it's like 36,000, to be honest with you. Okay. So he's going to have $36,000 of cash at 65. Okay. Well, from age 30 to age 65 is how many years? 35 years, right? So if you take 36,000 divided by 35 years, how much is that a year? $1,028, is it? Hold on, we're gonna double check that. That's $1,028 a year, $1,028 a year. So basically, if you save $1,028 a year from now, until 65 from now until 65 
you'll save up how much? 36,000, right? Well, 128 to save, and I go like this, I always say, to save $128 a year is tough. Or, or, or to save $1,028 once a year is tough. So most people do it what? Monthly, right? So let's divide that by 12. So 128 divided by 12 is what? $85. $85. Okay. So now what you say to the guys, you say, so what's happening here is every single month, because think about it, your cash value at 65 is going to be worth $36,000. Okay. So um, every single month, $85 for the next how many years is going to be going it, for the next 35 years, $85 a month is going, your cash value is growing by $85 a month. So this person's cash value is growing by $85 a month. And I don't really know what the premium is for, for a, a 30 year old for a select policy. If somebody can yell it out or let me know, but I'm not sure what it is, okay? But I'm just assuming it's $96, but it might be less than that, okay? But I'm gonna tell them this now. I'm gonna say now, Joe, every time that you put $96 a month into your program, okay? Part of the money goes towards cost of insurance. The other part goes towards cash value. Uh, you have $85 going towards your cash value. So $11 a month is actually going to pay for your cost of insurance. And I go, I guess, to the client. You're going to say, Joe, I want you to understand this because sometimes clients don't understand and they think that they're putting $96 a month all towards insurance, right? And uh, in this situation, $96 a month, um, you only have $11 going towards the insurance, 85 is really going towards cash value for you and your family. Hey, that's even better. How about that? I said 96 guys, guess what the number is? What do you think it is, Mace? 92. 82. 82. So that's even better for our argument here. Because now you could even tell them this. Every time you put $82 in, your cash is growing by 85. So cost of insurance, what's it cost you? And I got to guess. If you put an 82, but your cash grows at 85, what does it cost you? And they're like, uh, I don't know. Nothing, right? I'm like, exactly. You're actually making three dollars a month on a situation what's the cash value of 65 though since you had that book out because i don't know if it's 36 we could be wrong on that too <laughs> could be wrong probably be 39 it's 34 34 841 so i was off by like 1200 so off by like 1200 so 1200 dollars over 30 some years probably about that three dollars so it's probably even bet you that's just probably like you put in 82 and 82 goes towards the cash. You're not even paying for your life insurance, right? Pretty cool. So then you go like this though. You say, now, Joe, if you put $82 a month in your policy from now, 12 months, and then times that by 35 years, you're going to put in basically about $35,000, $34,000, right? If you pass away at any point in time, what's your family going to receive? hundred thousand dollars so today if uh you qualify for the program let's say you enroll into the program today okay you would put 82 dollars a month in today let's say two months went by you would have put a total of 160 dollars a month in 164 dollars okay if you put 164 dollars into this program and then you passed away what would your family receive a hundred thousand dollars right if if we went to the bank and we just did this at the bank account and you set 164 dollars into the bank account 82 dollars a month and two months went by and we passed away what would our family get a hundred only 162 dollars right so the problem with the bank is this dollar for dollar and uh, the interest rate that we're getting on our client right now, our clients are getting over 4% interest rate guaranteed on all their cash. 
and it's tax free and your family's protected. So um, if you live all the way to 65 and then you pass away, you would have put in 35,000, what would your family get? A hundred. If you wanted to leave your family with $100,000 by the time you reach 65, how much money would you have to save from now until 65? $100,000, right? So we're able to leave our family with $100,000. We set aside 35. That's a win-win situation, you know? But let's just say that you're 65 and you don't ever want to pay another nickel again. What's the paid up option? 72? 74? Yeah. 80,000. Oh, that's even better. So 80,000. So now you're 65 and you say, you know what? In 65, I don't need $100,000 of coverage anymore. I don't really want to pay anything. I'm at a fixed cost. I want to lower my monthly expenses, right? You don't want to pay. When you were younger, you needed 100,000. Now you're older, you don't need 100. So what you do is you say, I'm done paying. So to see this 82, you don't pay on us ever again, right? And your family's gonna get a guaranteed $80,000 whenever you pass away, guaranteed. And what did you put in? 35, 35 right? That's a guaranteed way to more than double your money. So this gives you options, control, and flexibility uh, later on in life, you know? You hey, hey, Tom. There's three things that will happen when you're 65. The first thing is you can do what? You can do nothing. You let everything stay the same. You just keep paying your $82 a month. And when your family, when you pass away, your family gets a hundred thousand. The second option is when you reach age 65, okay? You can actually access your cash value. You can borrow that money out of your own policy and it comes to you tax-free, okay? Now in that situation, if you borrow, if you took your thirty-six thousand, your thirty-five thousand, whatever that number is, thirty-five thousand, you can take that thirty-five thousand, do whatever you want with it, go on a trip around the world, buy an RV, you know, whatever you'd like to do with it, and you can, uh, and and then um, whenever you pass away, your family is going to receive the hundred thousand dollar death benefit minus anything that you've taken out. So in this situation, your family would receive the $100,000 death benefit minus that 35,000. So they would receive 65,000 at this situation. So now in this situation, you know, you put in your 35, you took all the money back out, right? And then you gave your family 65,000. And what did that cost you? Nothing. Every penny you put in, you took right back out you were protected for, and you were protected for, but the whole time you protected your family for $100,000 and you leave them with a guaranteed 65,000 and what it cost you. I'm just showing you how to get your family free money. You like free money? Literally. Third option is at 65, you can just stop paying on your coverage not pay any more money into the program and then take a guaranteed $80,000 guaranteed to the family. And here for you, Joe, if we figure it out, do the math with me, 65 to 30 is 35 years. If you do $82 a month for 12, that's going to be 35. So you're going to put 35 in and leave your family with a guaranteed what? 80, right? Last time, if you wanted to leave your family with a guaranteed 80, you'd have to save up how much? 80. So I basically just showed you how to double our money, right? And protect our family with $100,000 the whole entire time as well. So this is all the stuff, you know, if you know how to break down the numbers, it, it just helps people understand it more logically than emotionally. But this is an emotional sell. Don't forget this. This is an emotional sell at the end of the day. Uh, did we have a question though? Or do we? Answer? Yeah, I want quick, Tommy. Okay, yes. Whenever on the, <clears throat> whenever on the second option, whenever, if they borrow from their policy, and now the face value is going to come down minus what they borrowed. Do you mention anything about um, that it's tax free, but you're going to have to pay the interest? Or you don't even say anything about the interest. No, I don't say nothing about that. It's just too confusing at that point. Right, right. Gotcha. You know, just Unless they ask if there's like a. If there's a technical guy, you I could go technical with them all day long, but you know. Gotcha.
budget. And that's at 8% for the first year free? Just the no? I don't know. That's right. a good question. I just like being prepared, bro. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So another one? Are you using these explanations more for people that have like higher action potential that think more logically than emotionally? So they're kind of giving you rebuttals at the end and you're like, okay, let me show you the logical side of this rather than the emotional side. Um, this is a great thing to have as a rebuttal for sure. You know, um, I use this whenever I just start talking about life insurance with people, you know, somehow I get into it as conversation <laughs> with people, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I swear the last presentation I did, I just got my scratch paper out and I was right holding up to the screen, holding up to the screen. I was doing the same drawings I've been doing for 12 years, the same thing. I said, so, you know, first of all, we have term, right, Mary? Term, you can get it for 5, 10, 15 years. You have it goes up, right? 65 goes away. It's like leasing. It's like renting. All the money you pay goes towards cost of insurance. What happens at the end of term? Terminates, right? Then I say, then you have whole life, Mary. Then whole life, the way whole life works, it covers you for your what? Your whole life. That's right, Mary. So that means it's going to be in place for ever no matter what see term it only passes the only way this money gets paid out to your family is if over here since it's been placed forever we know that we're going to pass away someday so this is more what when right difference when you put money into here all the money's going towards cost of insurance to make sure that death benefit stays in place put money over here money's going towards whole life cost of cash value cost of insurance cash you know, grows at 60 865 you have tax tax free options 865 it goes away 865 it's here this is like owning, leasing. This is like owning and building equity. This is like leasing and renting something. When you lease and rent something, you got to give it back over here. You own this forever, you know, uh, blah, blah, blah. So, so I go over that. Then after that, I do the same thing I do. I just say, all right, so you understand how whole life of term works? Okay, great. Because now all we got to do is know how to, what, what you got to have. So because what happens is different people have different needs. You know, right now you guys are young, so your needs are going to be different. As you get older over what? over time, what's gonna to happen to your needs? They're gonna change, right? Typically when people are younger, they have higher needs. The first thing is we pass away to tomorrow by Friday or Saturday, we have to make sure the funeral is taken care of. Then the debt collectors are gonna come. So you have to make sure all debts are paid off, right? So how many debts do we have? We have mortgage and cars, student loans, credit cards. Okay, what's that? 150,000, all right, great. And then also Mary, you know, he's a single income. You're, you're going to have two kids left behind to take care of the kids. His income right now, they recommend to have at least five years of his income in place. He's, he makes what? Hundred. He makes what? 100,000, 50,000? Okay, so 50,000, that's 250,000 right there. So the freedom uh, for, the, for the funeral, you know, you're, you're 30 years old right now. 65 is over here, you know, and then when you pass away all the way down here, you're going to need enough to make sure when you pass away, there's, there's, there's nothing left behind to be burdened to your funeral. So we want to make sure the funeral is taken care of and we leave a legacy. So what we're going to do is we'll make sure we have $100,000 in place here. You can build cash value. This will be your whole life coverage, right? But then after that, we have to make sure that if you pass away before you reach age 65, right, we have to make sure that this need gets covered because right now you need uh, 100, 150, 250,000. You need about 500,000 minimum you know, to make sure your family's even protected. But also think about this. If Mary, Joe, if, 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 if uh, Joe passes away, Mary, you need to have your uh, six months of living expenses set aside. That's the number one rule of financial planning. So um, do you guys have six months of your living expenses set aside? What are your living expenses? Four grand. Okay, what's four times six? 24,000. Okay, so basically you need $25,000 set aside that if Joe passed away tomorrow, you would need that money just in a safety cash reserve account, like just for basic fundamentals of, of financial planning principles, right? So we need at least another 25,000 for cash reserves that's not set up, set aside. Think about that. Do you think it's cool to leave Mary hanging with no money in her bank account? Think about that. Just lost her husband, worried about, you know what I mean? All right, she paid the house off, cool. You know, she has a little bit of income coming in, which basically is like week to week paycheck. She just buried her husband. So that money's gone and there's nothing in the bank account. Is that wise? No, definitely not. So we need to make sure that the family also has at least six months of their living expenses set aside as well. 
So you could add that into the need. That's how much they need right now, you know? All right, but what happens over time is the mortgage is gonna get started, get paid off. The debts are gonna get paid off. The children are gonna get older. They're gonna move out of the house, all that stuff. And then when I reach age 65, uh, my need's gonna go down and become fixed. All I'm gonna need at that point is enough for when I pass away to make sure my funeral is not burning to my family and to make sure that I leave a legacy behind for the, fam for the people that I love and care and I'm responsible for. So what I'll do is, uh, uh, what we wanna do is make sure that we have the whole life coverage to last now until forever. And that'll be your ace up your sleeve. It'll be your foundation. It'll be, uh, it'll build cash value for you. And then we'll use the term coverage to cover for if you pass away. Joe, if I ask a lot of people, are you going to pass away before or after 65? What do you, a lot of people think they tell me? Everybody says after 65, but Hey, we can't deny it. There's always that possibility that if we pass away before 65, right? So for the, if this is what we use the term coverage for whole life. Of it, and then we could add some accidental death benefit to top it off to make sure they're covered properly, right? So for, so for you, Joe, um, what we would look at for you would be like this. You need $500,000 of coverage. That's what we just established. So we'll do this. We'll do $100,000 of whole life. We'll do $200,000 of term. And we could do $200,000 of ADB to get your foot in the door. Another option for you is you can do $200,000 of whole life. We could do $300,000 of term and we could do $200,000 of ADB as an extra, you know? And another option for you would be to do, you know, whatever. Uh, you could do uh, $100,000 of whole life, $400,000 of term, and, and, then, and then you could talk about adding the 200,000 of accidental death benefit as extra, you know? So this would probably be like the option A, most expensive, Option B, second most expensive. Option C, third most expensive. We covered 500,000 all three ways, right? Let me just educate him on, on it. So while you think about what's best for you, I need to make sure you guys can even qualify first and then I'll qualify them. I mean, that's how fast we could do this shit, you know? Makes sense, doesn't it? I don't, that's how I... Uh, that's how I sell life insurance. That's hey, Tom, I've got one more question for you. I know I'm running out of questions. I'm sorry. Okay, shoot. So just for an example, to go back to that um, second paid up option, I'm going to use a simple number of a 30-year-old, okay? For a 30-year-old like smoker rates, it says that he would pay $107 a month for a $42,000 um, 42,638 cash value. So if you did the math, the 107 times 12 to see what you pay yearly times 35, it would be like 44,000. So if somebody did that math and seen, oh, well, my cash value, I'm $2,000 less. Where did that go? How do you explain that to it? Don't look like, oh, we're not, because every single person will probably think, oh, this is how. I'm... Did you guys hear how I did that? We already did that. We already did that. I gave the example earlier. I said, you're paying $96 a month, okay? Your cost of insurance, uh, your cash value is growing at $84 a month. Right? Yeah. Right. So, so, so it, every time you put $96 a month into your program, okay, $84 of that is going into your cash value for your family growing tax-free at 4%, okay? So, so um, cost of insurance for you is only $12 a month. Now, most people, the, what sometimes they don't understand is they'll look at their $96 a month and they'll think that all $96 a month is going towards their cost of insurance. They're like, I'm paying $96 a month for insurance? And I gotta always remind them, you know, hey, not with us. Your $96 a month is not all going towards insurance. In fact, only $12 a month is going towards the insurance. $84 of that is going towards your cash. So that's how you flip it. Got it. Yeah, perfect. So that's how you flip it there, guys. It's all good either way. I mean, it ain't always going to be to where you put in 96, but your cash value grows at 120. 
it's going to usually be the other way. And it's still good because it's better than what they were thinking. You know what they were thinking? It's like, oh, dude, $130 a month, all for insurance. That sucks. But I guess I got to do it and they'll bite the bullet. But then you slide in here and say, oh, calm down, man. $130 a month. It's only really like $20 a month. 110 of that is actually going to your cash value, man. And they're like, oh, all right. Well, that makes a lot of sense. And it makes me a little bit more comfortable with my monthly investment. Now, every time that gets handled. Now, please, when we're in these homes, okay, last thing. How do we talk about the bank accounts, okay? You do not tell them that, uh, so, um, you know, what, what's your bank account information? They're gonna, uh, they're gonna take this out of your checking account once a month. They're gonna, they're gonna deduct this. They're gonna deduct this out of your bank account once a month. You do not say that, okay? You do not, nobody wants to hear that they're taking stuff out of my bank account on a monthly basis, right? So what I do is I say, okay, Joe, um, uh, what's nice about the program, what's nice about the program is what they do they handle it once a month electronically through our banking system, through our bank, not your, our banking system. What, what banking system do you guys use? Oh, we use Chase or whatever. Oh, that's great. Our, we actually work with them, so there should be no issues there. And what's nice about it is you actually get to choose whichever day of the month you'd like it handled, and they'll handle it for you uh, real nice and easy for you, and you're under complete control right? Handle it. They handle it once a month electronically through our banking system. A lot, lot better way to say it, you know? So those small things, man, I'm telling you, it makes, makes a difference. Okay. And we'll keep working on adding more and more words into our repertoire. Cool. So, That's good. I was saying the other way. <laughs> yeah. See that? There we go. We keep, we keep sprucing it up. Okay. All right, guys, let's go. Let's have a good one. Appreciate it.